Good morning. Welcome to Mulberry Street United Methodist Church on this Palm Sunday. We're glad that you're joining us today, whether here online, or here online, or however you may be joining us together. A few announcements to share with you. We are a church on mission to share the heart of God from the heart of downtown Macon. Here's how you can be part of that mission. First, we have these wonderful yard signs. They're available in the narthex. They're available as you exit the sanctuary. They're available in the atrium. It's a suggested donation of $15, uh, but if you just take one and don't donate, that's okay. The more of these that go in yards around town, the more we help advertise what we have going on this coming weekend, and I'll speak more to that in a moment. Uh, before I do that, please note in your bulletin the note about the flowering of the cross. We need your flowers so that we can create the living cross next week. Uh, so if you will bring those uh, ahead of our services on Easter Sunday, you see the note in your bulletin, that will help us to create that cross. Uh, third, uh, we have many things coming up this week that I hope that you'll take note of. Uh, first is the Holy Week services that are happening at noon every day this week. We've got a series of guest speakers. Our district superintendent, Craig Hutto, will speak on Monday or preach. Anne Bosarge, uh, who many of you know from doing our onboarding, will be here Tuesday. Jay Harris, who is the Director of Ministerial Services for the annual conference and was my pastor when I was called into ministry, will be here Wednesday. Uh, Rachel Hartman, the chaplain at Wesleyan College, will be here on Thursday. And then our own Katie Griffiths will return from Bethlehem, Georgia, to be with us uh, on Friday and preach Good Friday. So I hope that as your schedule allows, you'll be here at noon. Services will be approximately 30 minutes and will be followed by lunch in the fellowship hall. Then we've got our Easter egg hunt coming up on Saturday. Uh, you'll see your note in the bulletin about that. Thank you for bringing eggs back to help us be prepared for that on Saturday. Sunday, we'll have our sunrise service at 7 a.m. on Coleman Hill, um, and that will be led by myself, Andrew Gordon of Christ Episcopal Church, Scott Dickinson of First Baptist Church, and Sarah Pugh Montgomery from Centenary United Methodist Church. So back to our interdenominational roots at that service. Then we'll have our butterfly release and our sanctuary worship at 11 here in the sanctuary. I'm going to catch my breath and let you digest all of that and hope that you can make as much of it as possible. Finally, of course, you can always support the mission of this church by your presence here in worship and at our events and volunteering, by giving to support the church, and by praying for the church. We are the church together, and I'm glad that you're here with us this morning. Let us turn our hearts and our minds and our attention, all that we are and all that we have, to the worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks. We will journey through praise with joy on our lips. We will travel through betrayal and death, cradling hope deep in our hearts. Jesus leads us through this week, and we will follow, for he is the life that we long for. He is the word who sustains us. We weigh palm branches and anticipation. We lay our love before him to cushion his walk. Setting aside all power, glory, and might, he comes, modeling humility and obedience for all of us. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who brings us the kingdom of God. Let us now stand for the reading of our proclamation of the entrance into Jerusalem. Hear from the Gospel according to Luke how our Lord Jesus entered Jerusalem. After he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sent Jesus on it. 
As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us now remain standing and affirm our faith together with our Linton affirmation of faith as printed in your bulletin, saying together, The risen, living Christ calls us by our name, comes to the loneliness within us, heals that which is wounded within us, comforts that which grieves within us, releases us from that which has dominion over us, cleanses us of that which does not belong to us, renews that which feels drained within us, awakens that which is asleep in us, names that which is still formless within us, empowers that which is newborn within us, consecrates and guides that which is strong within us, restores us to this world which needs us, reaches out in endless love to others through us. The living Christ calls us by our name.
As we approach this time of preaching, let's pray together. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for you. Unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken. Amen. Merry Easter. I hope that as the day approaches, you have a holly jolly Easter. I imagine you have Easter presents already in mind, and if you've not yet, good luck finishing your Easter shopping. How many Easter parties have you already attended? How many do you have left to attend? Have you already grown weary from all the social obligation that comes with this time of year? I bet you plan to visit many family members during the Easter break, spending time in the warmth and hearth of kin. There's lots to do to be ready for Easter, to enjoy the holiday to its fullest while meeting all the social and familial obligations. So I wish you, as you prepare for the big day, a Merry Easter. It might sound funny, but if we skip ahead to Easter, paying no mind to the week that is before us, we approach Easter in much the same way we approach Christmas, with much joy and merriment. And certainly Easter is reason to celebrate and be full of joy. But before we can get to the color and the pageantry, before we can get to Easter, there's darkness, despair, and death. To truly celebrate and understand Easter, we must go through Holy Week first. Palm Sunday today is full of pomp and circumstance, as we've already experienced through the wonderful procession and the anthem we just heard. But Palm Sunday foretells a great change coming, just as we heard at the start of the service during the proclamation of the entrance into Jerusalem. Indeed, everything in Luke's gospel has been moving toward this moment. There's this great image Luke uses across the two books that he wrote, Luke and Acts. The gospel begins with the ends of the earth, and as the story progresses, it moves to the Middle East, to Judea and Samaria, and finally to Jerusalem at this moment when Jesus enters the city. Then in Acts, the movement is the reverse. The gospel spread, spreads from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to the Middle East, and then to the ends of the earth. It's beautiful and it's poetic, just like everything Luke has done so far in his gospel that builds to this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus has a plan as he enters, a plan to demonstrate that he is king and upstage the Roman rulers, especially Pilate, who likes to ride into Jerusalem at the same time of year, riding a mighty stallion with a legion behind him. Jesus is showing that he's the real king, but on a humble colt, not a great stallion, and with not a red carpet and an army, but the coats of the humble everyday person surrounded by his disciples. And here in Luke, it's not the great masses of people who greet him as in other gospels, but rather just his disciples. Even so, the Pharisees can't take it. They're so worried about what this will mean for their power because Jesus also means to upstage them and show how their power is built on a sandy foundation. The politics, the showmanship, the poetry of this moment are great, each of them worthy of their own sermon. Don't worry, I don't have three sermons this morning. There are issues here of cosmic significance, especially around power that earthly power, no matter how great and grand it may be, is nothing compared to God's power. Jesus speaks to this when saying at the very end that if the, of the scripture that if the stones themselves were silent, they would shout out, or if the crowds were silent, the stones themselves would shout out. Jesus shows and states that true power, the kind of power that can really make a difference, is power characterized by humility, gentleness, and devotion to God. But there's more to this story and more to Palm Sunday than a message about power. 
It's easy on this Palm Sunday to get lost in the pageantry and the pomp and circumstance and the poetry and miss something incredibly fundamental to the story. It's easy to jump ahead to Easter with all of its color and celebration. As much as saying Merry Easter doesn't make any sense, we are prone to jump ahead to Easter, for we in the church live our lives Sunday to Sunday. But Thursday is coming, with the darkness settling over Jesus and his disciples. Thursday is coming when Judas will betray him. Thursday is coming when he will break the bread and hold the wine and declare his own death. Thursday is coming when he will go to the garden and be abandoned by his disciples. Thursday is coming when he will be arrested. And then Friday is also coming. Friday where he will stand trial not once but twice. The law rightly administered will fail him, both religious and civil law. Friday is coming where he will walk down the Via de la Rosa. Friday is coming where he will be nailed to the cross. Friday is coming where he will cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Friday is coming where he will die. Thursday is coming. Friday is coming. And Jesus knows it. Imagine the scene. Here he is on his first palm, on this first Palm Sunday, riding in triumphantly on the colt, his disciples cheering him, throwing their coats on the ground in a sign of royalty, just like they did for the former kings of Israel. Everything is going very well. His first trip to Jerusalem is a smashing success. But as he rides the colt through the parade, like a hero returning to the U.S., riding through New York City, ticker tape falling. As he does that, he knows Thursday is coming. Friday is coming. Change is coming. And that must produce some serious anxiety. We've been there. We know what it is to anticipate change and be anxious or fearful. On the positive side, we know what it is to look ahead to a graduation and feel the anxiety of that change as much as the completion of school is reason to celebrate. We know what it is to look ahead to a job change, a transfer, the birth of a child, and feel the anxiety of that change as much as those are reasons to celebrate. Easter is like that. There's the looking ahead toward the cross and the empty tomb, which is much reason to celebrate. But that's not the case for Jesus. No, he's got to go through his own death first after being betrayed, humiliated, and tortured. And he knows it's coming. On Thursday, he'll ask God to take it all away. On Friday, he'll cry out to God in agony from the cross. He knows it's coming. Like we who anticipate the results of a medical test to confirm what we already know, that we have cancer or some other dreaded disease, or we await the results of a legal case to confirm what we already know, that we're about to lose assets, or we await the results at our workplaces to confirm what we already know, that we're losing our job. Those things get us closer to what Jesus is anticipating, the change he knows he's about to experience as he rides into Jerusalem. Thursday is coming. Friday is coming. Change is coming. So it's reasonable, and in fact, it's essential to recognize Jesus must be very anxious about all this change as he rides triumphantly into Jerusalem. And we today can relate to that anxiety in the ways that we experience change, for good and for bad. Think to yourself, what changes you are anticipating at this moment in life right now. Major life changes, perhaps. Changes to your business or job. Changes with your parents or children. Changes to your health. Now, how do those changes make you feel? Anxious? Excited? Fearful? Some combination of the three? All of that is perfectly normal and to be expected. 
Just like Jesus riding into Jerusalem, anticipating anxiously and fearfully the coming days where he will be maligned, tortured, crucified, and buried. We know what it's like to expect and anxiously await change. Jesus knows it too. He's been there. He experienced it on this first Palm Sunday and that first Holy Week. Change is inevitable. And when we are experiencing anxiety, when we're fearful about change, when we're tossing and turning and up late at night, when we're fighting against a fear that won't let go because of change we expect is coming, how do we handle the change? To answer that question, let's look more closely at this Palm Sunday moment. As we ask ourselves, how do we handle the change? Note first that Jesus keeps moving forward. Jesus could have turned his back on Jerusalem, but he didn't. He could have tried to have fleed the change, but he didn't. He rides headlong into the change, even as it produces anxiety and fear. Doesn't that ring true to our experience? When we're facing change, especially change we didn't ask for and don't want, it's very tempting to try and flee from it, to try and escape it. Of course we can't, but it's a natural reaction. It's reasonable to think that Jesus felt the same impulse as he rode into Jerusalem, but even if he did, he did not flee. He kept moving forward, straight into a future he knew was full of change and hardship. He could keep moving forward because he trusted God. His faith and his commitment to the mission allowed him to keep moving forward. Jesus was equally human as he was divine. He had to keep walking, keep moving forward into a future he knew was full of challenge, difficulty, and death because he understood our human weakness that wants to flee change. He could keep moving forward because he knew God would take care of him. And we can do so as well because we know God will provide for us. Change can be scary. Whether we're facing graduations, job changes, test results, anything anxiety producing, change is never easy. And Jesus shows us that the first thing we do when we're facing change of any kind is to keep moving forward, trusting God to provide. Second, we keep helping. Note the way Luke spends so much time talking about the cult. The owners of the cult only needed to hear that the Lord needs it, and they gave up the cult for his use. Also note that the disciples threw their coats on the ground, which is a sign of royalty. But in both cases, the owners of the cult and the disciples gave of what they had, literally the clothes on their backs in some cases, to help Jesus, to serve him. So it is with us. We are to give of what we have, helping where we can to aid each other in times of change. We can give of our attention and ear as we listen to those who are feeling anxious about impending change. We can give of our time to help our family and friends who are experiencing change, finding ways to love on them and bring the presence of Christ to bear in their lives. We can lend our help, as this is especially, I think, important, when we are facing change ourselves, it's good to go volunteer and help others, and we can do that at Make an Outreach, at the Children's Center, with our children and youth, with any of a number of ministry efforts here at the church. Any of our staff and lead volunteers would love it if you were to walk up to them and say, I don't know what you need, but I'm here to help. We can give of our resources to help support the church. We aren't asked to give of what we don't have. No, the example of Palm Sunday is the people gave of what they had to help out. So it is for us. When we're facing change of any kind, keep helping. Third, when facing change, keep leading. Jesus didn't shirk his responsibilities. It's tempting during times of transition where we have responsibility to want to avoid it as a way of avoiding the change. 
Think of senioritis, for example, or the way that people tend to drop balls as they're leaving a job, or the way we might stop taking care of ourselves when we're facing a terrible health diagnosis or some mental health malady. We must keep leading, doing what we know is right, attending to our responsibilities rather than avoid them. Jesus did that. He knew the disciples would abandon him in the end, but he kept leading them, teaching them Monday through Wednesday. He even kept leading them through Thursday with Judas's betrayal and Peter's denial. He kept leading even on the cross as he looks down at the one remaining disciple, John, and tells John to take his mother, Mary, in as if Mary was John's own mother to make sure Mary was cared for. In the midst of great, terrible, tragic change, Jesus kept leading. And we can too. We should keep leading ourselves, doing what we know is right, engaging in self-care when going through change or anxiously anticipating it. We should keep leading our families and our workplaces, no matter how much anxiety or fear we have about the coming change, attending to our responsibilities. We should keep leading in our community, even when we see change on the horizon, no matter how anxious or fearful it makes us, attending to our responsibilities. Palm Sunday, the story crafted here so carefully by Luke, shows us three things we should do when anticipating change of any kind. Keep moving forward, keep helping, keep leading. To be sure, none of us this morning are facing the kinds of things Jesus faced on Palm Sunday. But if Jesus could keep moving forward, keep helping, and keep leading, knowing the change that was to come, how much more so can we, who are facing change of any kind, do the same? We can, because just as God provided for Jesus throughout his ordeal, the one that we remember this Holy Week, God will provide for us too. Sometimes change in our lives is because of something God is doing in our lives. Sometimes change is because of the presence of evil in the world. Regardless, God's ways will prevail. The empty tomb proclaims that loudly and clearly. God's power that we celebrate on this Palm Sunday will have the final say. There will be an end to our anxiety and fear. The change in the end will produce something great and good because that's how God works creating good and redeeming the bad, just as we see through the, re the resurrection that redeemed the crucifixion. Change is never easy. Transitions are hard. But God is faithful. God is good in the midst of it. What changes are you anticipating today? What changes do you see coming on the horizon? Changes to your family, your job, Changes in terms of schooling, changes to your health. What changes do you see coming? Palm Sunday shows us the way forward when in the midst of change. So don't skip ahead to Easter. Don't miss this Holy Week with all of the change that it brings. Attend the noon services here daily this coming week. Come to the evening Maundy Thursday Tenebrae service. Don't skip ahead to Easter. Go through the change with Jesus this week, as hard as that is. Embrace the tragedy, heartbreak, and death. It's not easy, but change is never easy. But doing so, going through the change, teaches us how to handle change like Jesus did. Keep moving forward. Keep helping. Keep leading. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Come now to our moment of communion, and I remind us that as this is a table in the United Methodist Church, all are welcome to come and receive of any age, regardless of denominational affiliation or creed. Hear these words of invitation. Christ our Lord invites to this his table all who love him, who earnestly seek to repent of their sins and live in peace with one another. 
Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful Lord God. God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love, and we have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, our Alpha and our Omega, whose strong and loving arms encompass the universe, for with your eternal word and Holy Spirit you are forever one God. Through your word you created all things and called them good, and in you we live and move and have our being. When we fell into sin, you did not desert us. You made covenant with your people Israel and spoke to us through prophets and teachers. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, who called you Abba, Father. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embrace the people as your own and fill them with a longing for a peace that would last and a justice that would never fail. In Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. And as the grain and the grapes once dispersed in the field are now united here on this table in bread and wine, so may we and all your people from every time and place be gathered into the unity of your eternal household and feast at your heavenly table forever. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
What a joyful occasion we have today to celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we move towards our close, let us stand together and join in singing our final hymn. now may the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Go in peace.